and I'm really proud now to, uh, to introduce to you the moderator, who's a, a great friend of the Guild and, and also a great reporter. He is also the awards columnist for Deadline Hollywood, Pete Hammond. Hi, thank you. Uh, thanks. And uh, before we start, I do want to say you've got cards if you have a question to write your question out on a card. And at some point here, uh, the ushers will be discreetly picking up the cards from you so that I'll have them up here for our Q&A portion of today. So just take out your cards if you have a question and write it at, at some point if you haven't already done that. Um, I, I just want to say, look up Jerry Bruckheimer on IMDb, and you don't see separate categories like writing, directing, acting, only producing. For over 40 years, that's his title, and I just can't think of anyone more qualified to talk about the art and craft of producing than one of the most successful in the history of the business. Please welcome Jerry Bruckheimer. Okay, welcome, Jerry, and uh, and thanks for coming out today. You can see we've got a packed house here at the uh, at the Zanuck Theater. Another great producer, legendary name. You know, I mentioned you know when I look on IMDb, it's producing. It's producing. Sometimes producers want to direct at least once or write at least once. You're a true producer. I'm wondering, was that always your goal? Was that always your idea that I would just be a producer and that was that was what I wanted to do? Well, you know, when you find something that you really love, uh, you want to stick with it. And I love what I do, and uh, I just want to keep doing it. I've been doing it for a long time, and hopefully I can continue to do it for a long time. Uh, you know, there's the Peter principle, where you rise above what you're good at. and So when you find something you're good at, keep doing it. <laughs> well, obviously you have been very good at it. <laughs> I mean, it's astounding. When you look at your bio, all the numbers in there, what is it, $16 billion gross for your films? I mean, that's unheard of. Um, and I, you probably didn't expect it when you started out. But what is, what is the key thing that you've sort of learned as you've gone along, you know, that you learned in those early days when you started producing that you've taken all the way through your career? Well, I think it's, you know, it's always about the talent that you surround yourself with. And as long as we can convince really talented writers and actors and directors to work with us, we're going to be successful. We, our company worships talent, and uh, you know we feel that what our one of our skills is is picking the talent. You know, finding the ones that that haven't had the opportunity to show their how good they really are at either writing or directing or acting, and give them the opportunity to to you know express their creativity. And we've done it over and over again, and hopefully we'll continue to do it. But you know, it's a skill that's honed through the years of of you know I started in the mailroom. Uh, in Detroit, so it's you, you just you just immerse yourself in the arena that you want to be in, and you know from the time I was, uh, you know, in high school, I read everything about the the film business and became a student of of that wonderful wonderful medium, and so when I finally got an opportunity to come to Hollywood, at least I knew who the players were. I didn't know who they who actually know them uh, personally, but I certainly knew what they had done and what their expertise is. You know, it's interesting. You mentioned you started in the mailroom uh, all those years ago. You were in advertising, weren't you, originally? Was that how you sort of uh, got going? Yeah, I, I wanted to, to come to California and get into this wonderful business that I eventually got into. And I really had no avenue to get here. You know, I grew up in, in Detroit and from a lower middle class family. And my dad was a salesman and, and they were German Im immigrants. So I figured advertising was a way because there was film involved with advertising. They were selling your an idea, which is what we do all the time. We have to break these movies down into a single line, into an idea, and then sell them. I figured I'd learn something. So starting in the mailroom, I, I went to every division of that advertising agency and saw what everybody did. Because if you're friendly and you de develop, deliver the mail, uh, you get to meet everybody. So I found an area that I was interested in, which was television. And uh, I worked my way into the television department because the woman who ran it at the time um, needed help. You know, she, all she had was her dog and her husband, and she was 
uh, a person who didn't have time to pick up her, her laundry. So I would do whatever it took. If I had to pick up her laundry, I'd go pick up her laundry. And she said, I'd like to have somebody like this in my department who will do what he has to do uh, to help me out. And that's how I got out of the mailroom. I got to work with this woman. And, and when you were uh, in advertising, too, I know at the time, Bonnie and Clyde was a big movie. And you, you did a award-winning spot for Bonnie and Clyde. Is that right? Yeah. Well, that's how I got to New York. Uh, I, I produced a commercial for Pontiac that uh, kind of aped uh, Bonnie and Clyde. And, and we had Floyd Mutrix in it. And he became a very successful actor and, and writer. Uh, and that got me noticed in Time Magazine. It was written up there. And then some people from BBDNO, which is a, a large agency in New York, uh, brought me to New York to work on the uh, Pepsi-Cola account. So I did all the broadcast for Pepsi-Cola. So that was kind of my break to get out of Detroit. In fact, I'd never been to New, to New York before. And I think it was one of the first times I'd ever been on a plane. So, you know, my parents drove us everywhere. So uh, it was kind of interesting to get on a plane for the first time. <laughs> it's so perfect that 80 years ago, the Lone Ranger actually started on radio in Detroit. It's almost perfect symmetry for you because it comes from your hometown in a, in a weird way. That was one of the attractions, you know, when, when our staff brought me uh, the idea of the Lone Ranger and that the rights m might become available, I said, yeah, it started in Detroit in 1933, and it'd be nice to, to go back, even though I wasn't around then. Um, but uh, uh, it was it's nice to, to go back to your hometown and take an idea that started there and, and bring it to fresh audiences like we're going to do this summer. Now, we got a room full of producers here, and I know they're curious, so how you go from advertising to making movies, and you made your first movie, which also, ironically, the Culpepper Cattle Company, you were the associate producer on, was a Western, and this is the first Western you've done since then, so it's sort of bookending your career at this point, but... <laughs> yeah, it's kind of interesting, after all these years, that was back in the, in the 70s when we released that picture that I come back to a Western, after Westerns, uh, at least in Hollywood terms, haven't been as successful as as the previous Westerns uh, back in the 70s and, and maybe in the 80s. So it's nice to bring the kind of heroic character back to the West. So how did you wind up on Culpepper? That was the first movie that you were, you know, actually had experience with. Well, I was producing commercials in New York, and I was working with a, a director named Dick Richards. And Dick uh, wor was working on a screenplay that 20th Century Fox was interested in producing. And he said, you know, Jerry, I'm going to go out to, to California and, and make this movie. I'd love you to come with me. And I took that opportunity to, to leave New York and got paid very little money to do that. But I always bet on myself and bet on my ability uh, to succeed. And I took that chance and came out here and worked on a number of films with him and then went off on my own. Wow. And some of those films early on were uh, March or Die, Gene Hackman, right? Uh, Farewell, My Lovely must have been fun because that was Robert Mitchum sort of going back and doing that Bogart type type thing. What was that like, working with Mitchum on Farewell? Well, Mitchum was a real character. Uh, you know, he's a, a, an iconic star and, and certainly lit up the screen and he was a wonderful man to work with. And, uh, you know, I, I treasure those those moments that I got to work with him and Charlotte Rampling. So I, and on a, working on Ra Raymond Chandler novel that we did, is that's a classic for me anyway. How did you find American Gigolo, which came, uh, you know, shortly thereafter? Well, I, when I moved to uh, to California, I was married and, and eventually got divorced and was looking for a place to live. And I had become friendly with uh, a, a man named Don Simpson, and he had a, a, a kind of a big house in, in Laurel Canyon. And one of his roommates had moved out, so I moved in there. And he was somebody who was in publicity at the time and wanted to get into the movie business. And he had the opportunity to interview for a job at uh, Paramount, and he borrowed my sport jacket because he didn't have any clean clothes, <laughs> and, and went to this interview uh, with uh, Dick Silbert, and who was just made the head of, uh, I think it was Paramount, yeah. And uh, he worked as his assistant, and eventually became the head of production there. And so, since we were friends, American Gigolo came along, and they needed somebody to actually produce the picture because the, the producers were uh, managers. So I got the, the opportunity to, uh, to work on that picture because of him. Did you know that would be such an iconic picture? I mean, it really made Richard Gere's career, and you know, at the time it was huge. Well, Paul Schrader was uh, the director and the writer of that, and of course he did a lot of fantastic work uh, prior to that. So I was very fortunate to work with him. He's an enormous talent and, and still, still making movies. So that was a big break for me, just to get the opportunity to, to work with a talented man like, uh, like Paul. But, you know, what happened is John Travolta was originally supposed to star in the movie, 
and unfortunately he lost his the love of his life at the time and decided to drop out. So Paul and I said, we gotta keep this movie going. And the person that, that Paramount wanted to put in the picture, because it was a risky movie, uh, and losing Travolta was at the time the biggest star, they wanted Christopher Reeve, who'd just come out in Superman, and unfortunately he passed on the project. Uh, Richard Gere had just been in uh, Mr. Goodbar and was an emerging star, so Paul and I kind of drove out to his house and tried to convince him to be in the movie. Unfortunately, Paul's a great salesman and, and did, the, did the trick and got uh, Richard to agree to do the movie. So Monday morning, we came into Paramount and said, Christopher Reeve passed, but we have Richard Gere. And at the time, the picture was, I think, uh, a, a very expensive movie because we had you know the big stars in it. And Paul and I, you know, cut the budget way down and went to Paramount and said, we'll, we'll make the picture for a price and if you make it with Richard Gere. And fortunately, the people at Paramount said yes, and that's how I got my movie made with, uh, with Paul Schrader. And then, at uh, Paramount, you, uh, you obviously hooked up with Don Simpson as very famous producing team with Flashdance, which is still one of the most iconic movies. I just saw this studio's movie, The Internship, last night, and it's a big part of that. It's like they use it to inspire all these people at Google, these stories of how the dancer in, in flash dance. It's really hilarious. And <laughs> there's a Broadway show going on and a commercial. I mean, did you have any idea at the time this would be that kind of a movie? And, and how'd you hook up with Don on it? Well, since Don and I were friends, uh, he, at the time, needed a, a producer to produce... Uh, Flash dance, and I was fortunately available and, and got involved with it. And because you know he, they had a slot open in April, and they wanted to get the picture made, and, and somehow we get things done. So uh, we worked on the script uh, with a number of writers, Joe Esterhaus being one of them, and you know got the picture to a place that, that Paramount said they would make it. Adrian Lyne was involved in the movie; he's an enormously talented director, uh, and he's got a, a, a wonderful visual sense. And I think that helped uh, get the picture to be the success that it became. Also, you know, it had a lot of heart into it. And we try to put into our movies, you know, the kind of, I guess, emotional um, things that, that helped our own careers and, you know, uh, not giving up and, you know, trying to strive for excellence. And that's what that character did. And she overcame her fears and uh, became uh, the person that she wanted to be. And so I guess that kind of mirrors my career. How did you go into pitch sessions and meetings with Don Simpson? How did you two do that together? Because famously, I mean, you know, he was known as Mr. Insider. You were known as Mr. Outside. And the two of you seemed like opposites in, in a way. How did it work as a producing team? Well, I mean, he was very gregarious and very funny and, you know, had a quick wit and a phenomenal vocabulary. And, in fact, uh, when I met him, he had a, his room was covered from wall to wall with books on the floor. And, you know, he studied vocabulary um, almost every day, he'd learn a new word. So he was a great speaker and, and a hysterical individual. So he would party and we'd go into these pitch meetings and he was a master at pitching ideas because he was, a, first of all, he was a head of Paramount, so he heard, you know, they were developing 100 projects every year and you need to listen to pitches. So he had a, a honed skill where I'm the quiet, shy type and he, he loved to be center stage. So it was a perfect match for me because he got to perform and I got to learn. <laughs> So you sat there, and then he would explain what was going on in the meeting later. <laughs> exactly right. <clears throat> he understood what went on in the halls of, uh, of a studio and knew what, the, what they were actually telling you wasn't what they really meant. So at, <laughs> at the end, at the end of a, a meeting, I'd say, Don, what just happened? And he'd explain, no, that what they just said is not really true. Here's what they really mean, and here's what we really have to do. So, you know, I got a good lesson in, in, uh, in studio life from Don. That's amazing. I remember my first encounter with you, which you'd never remember, but I was at Entertainment Tonight at the time, and we went and did a story on the two of you and went into your offices, which were wild. It looks like you guys were having so much fun. I don't know if it was because our cameras were there, but it, it just looked like a loose kind of operation that was really, you know, really into movies and making movies. Well, we both, you know, he grew up in Alaska and, and just loved films. That was his, you know, outlet. Uh, and he was somebody that would, you know, hit three movies a, in a weekend, and I would do the same thing growing up in Detroit. So we loved the cinema, and so the opportunity to be able to work in Hollywood and to work on movies and create movies and find great talent was something that he loved as much as I did. So it was a lot of fun what we were doing. Not that it wasn't stressful, because it was. 
because when you're trying to make it in this town, you know, there are thousands of other people who are trying to do the same thing you are, and there are not that many movies that studios make. And in fact, they were making a lot more movies then than they are now, but the fortunate thing you have now if you're producing, you can make television, you can do things for cable. There's so many outlets for producers to produce things. Uh, when we started, there were four channels, there was three networks, and movies, and movies have been cut way back when studios like Fox were making 50, 54 movies a year, the studios were making 25 or 30, and now they're making even less. So, much different. So, for you as a producer now, it has changed quite a bit in those sense of 40 years ago when you started. I mean, it's a completely different business in some ways. It is, but it, it didn't change like it changed when, it, when the transition came to the 50s and 60s and 70s. Uh, when the studios were had all the talent under contract, whether you're a writer or director or producer, you all worked for Fox. Fox had a team of writers, and it was a factory where they'd have somebody create the plot, somebody would come in and then do the dialogue, somebody would create the characters or hone the characters. They'd bring in a female writer to write the female dialogue. They'd bring in a comedy writer to write to put the jokes into the movies, and it, they were cranking out these films. So there was a huge transition that happened. Uh, I guess it was in, in, the, in the 60s when that, that, that whole system fell apart. Yeah. But, um, you know, of all the movies, I can read off some of them. Vance mentioned some of them. But, you know, uh, obviously Top Gun and Bad Boys and Days of Thunder and Beverly Hills Cop. I mean, what a lineup you and Simpson made together. I got to ask you about Top Gun. It's celebrating its 30th anniversary next year. And there was talk, I know, before Tony Scott um, died, that there would be a sequel after all of these years. Is that still happening, or is that something? Well, we, for 30 years, we've been trying to make a sequel, and uh, we, we're not going to stop. So hopefully it doesn't take another 30, because I won't be around. But, <laughs> but uh, we, uh, we love the project. We love working with Tom. Uh, so let's hope, and Paramount's very interested in doing it. But you know, it's, it's never easy to, to make a sequel, especially to an iconic movie like, uh, t like Top Gun. 30 years, a long time to make a sequel, too. I mean, you know, obviously you make sequels in some cases every other year to, to the movies or every three years, but 30 years, do you think the audience will still, still be there? Well, what Tom tells me, no matter where he goes in the world, people refer to him as Maverick. So uh, <laughs> Top Gun has become an iconic film for, for kids. Kids watch it on their DVDs or watch it on cable. Uh, it's it's a it's a movie that's been passed down from generation to generation. So it's something he's excited about, and as long as he keeps his enthusiasm, hopefully we can get it made. You see, see seamlessly to have moved into a solo producing career after Don died. I think during the production of The Rock was uh, when that happened. Right. How did that change for you, uh, your career, and, and and that, and how did that affect you, uh, per, you know, in your career? Well, when you have an iconic and interesting partner like Don, who was such a flamboyant character, character, it you know it's kind of scary to be out on your own and to have to do a lot of things he did, although I couldn't do them as well. Uh, but you find your own your own pace and your own way of doing things. And fortunately enough, I you know got a number of movies developed and got them made, and that's that's what you have to do. You have to learn from the past and look forward. And I never look back. I always learn from the past and and try to try to figure out what I learned not to make the same mistake again. What is it that makes a successful Bruckheimer film? Is, are you trying to make a film that you think the audience is going to like? Are you trying to make a film that you want to see? I mean, what's your thing when you look at a, a story or however the, the projects come to you that says this is going to be my next movie? Uh, I think that you, I don't know what an audience wants because you know I'm part of the audience, but I'm just one person. So I think if you try to figure out what an audience wants to go see, you're going to fail. I think you've got to go with your own gut, and hopefully your gut is what people want to see, and that's what we do. I try to make movies that I would like to go see, that I would like to spend my money on and you know, get my popcorn and sit there and relax and watch, watch an interesting film. Because it's so difficult to try to guess what you know, an audience wants to see. Years ago, there were, I think it was Fox who hired the head of General Mills to come in and run the studio, and he was a, a man who tested everything, because when you, you know, food products, you test them for years before you bring them to market. So every idea was tested, every script was tested, and they failed miserably. Because by the time you, you test the idea, you get a script, you test it again, the audience has changed, uh, and they want something else. The, that movie is old hat. So you just gotta go with what you believe in. And we always try to make films that, you know, 
haven't been around for a long time and are risky and and you know and that's the hardest thing to do when you make a western after westerns haven't been successful or you make a pirate movie after pirate movies haven't been successful you try to approach it from a different angle and that's what we've been doing we try to give you something completely different when an audience isn't expecting and pirates was a great example of a film that even the studio didn't have a clue what they had i mean our our merchandising was pretty much zero and uh uh, the film came out and did decent business, but it kept building and building and building because of the artistry of the people that were working on the movie, uh, starting with our writers, Elian Rossio, who, who created and made a, a different type of pirate movie, and Gore Verbinski, who's got a, an enormous talent for, for humor and for drama uh, and has a great eye for casting. You know, he's the real thing. So between what Elian Rossio did and what Gore did, and then bring Johnny Depp into the fold, who's uh, uh, such a creative actor. He, he uh, developed an iconic character that is one of the great, I think Empire Magazine said it was one of the great characters of the century. So I think that's pretty interesting. And Johnny you know, created that. It wasn't on the page what, what he did. And it certainly scared the studio when we, they first saw the dailies. They said, what is he doing? Is he gay? Is he drunk? What's going on here? <laughs> Uh, <coughs> I mean, yeah, the, the character that was written was like Burt Lancaster, who was a tough old pirate, and then, you know, all of a sudden you have a guy with eye makeup slurring his words and, you know, can barely stand up. So you can imagine if you're a studio executive seeing this, telling your bosses, well, gee, he's not Burt Lancaster, he's something else, we don't know what he is. But again, it's, you know, the management kind of settled into what he was doing and figured this is something different. But I, I think it caught everybody's surprise, but a surprise, not only the studio, but the public. And, you know, it became one of those movies that it was, it, it became your own. So in other words, it's nice to find a picture, you go see it, and it's not on the tip of everybody's tongue. And you tell your friend, hey, I just saw something that's really interesting. I want to take you to see it. And they see it again and again. And that's what happened. Didn't that whole thing start, as I remember, Michael Eisner decided he wanted to make uh, movies out of the rides at Disneyland, and they said they were going to do Pirates and The Haunted uh, House. Obviously, you chose the right one to do. Um, but, ha you know, you're, you're basically dealing with a ride at Disneyland and then creating this whole incredible franchise. Well, we did, we did differently. I mean, uh, they had the Bear Jamboree, and they had Haunted House, and... <laughs> and uh, a bunch of other films, and it, they tried to pigeonhole it in, into a budget, into a budget number. They wanted to make these low budget films, not low budget, but medium budget films about their rides. And you know, when Dick Cook called me and said, we have the script we want you to produce, and I read it and I said, it's a by the numbers you know, pirate movie, and I don't think this is gonna be very successful. Uh, we pitched it to Elian Rossio, who came up with the idea of the pirates turning the skeletons in the moonlight and returning a treasure rather than, than stealing a treasure, and it took it into the supernatural, which I thought was really interesting, and I felt that that was unique and different. You'd never seen a, a, a pirate movie like that. And to Dick Cook's credit, he said, go do it. And I said, Dick, it's not gonna be a PG movie. It's gonna be, it won't be an R, it'll be, most likely be PG-13, and Disney had never made a PG-13 movie in the past, so it, it, you need great executives and a team around you that make you look good, and Dick said, go do it. And so he's a big part of the success of that franchise, along with Eisner, who, who greenlit a very expensive movie with a director who'd just come off the, the Mexican, which wasn't a big hit, even though Gore had finished The Ring, but it hadn't come out yet. So, uh, you know, you, you take risks, and the studio, you know, got behind us, and it was an expensive movie in those days. It was over $100 million when they were making the other pictures for 50. So you have to try to convince the executives that you're doing the right thing for for them by spending their money and hopefully you make them money and that's you know the part of my career that keeps me going is we keep making them money not always but um, more than not yeah and you, you you that i should mention got johnny depp a best actor academy award nomination as well which was highly unusual for that genre of movie and things i just showed you it went way beyond the norm for that uh, you know, maybe what they wanted to make versus what you wound up making. But you're a strong producer. You know, you're a, you keep bringing in the, and take risk with the directors you bring in. You brought in, as you kept this franchise going, Rob Marshall, who wasn't known for doing that kind of movie for the last Pirates movie, which was hugely successful. And now you've hired the two Norwegian directors of Kontiki, a foreign language picture that was out, uh, out now, actually. Uh, 
why go with them? I mean, they don't have really a Hollywood background. Well, if you've got to look at their work, it's always about their work. You know, their Hollywood's full of great salesmen, and, you know, a director or a writer can come in and tell you a great tale but can't do the work. Uh, when you look at the work, these young gentlemen are enormously talented. You look at their body of work, and you look at Max Manus, and you look at Contiki, and they're the real thing. They make these movies for very little money. Uh, they're well written, they're well acted, they're well cast. Um, they have something special, and you look for something unique in, an, in a director, and they have something very unique that we like. They have a strong visual style, and they're great storytellers, and that's what, what audiences want. They want to be enwrapped in a story. They want to forget about um, their daily lives. They want you know, to get entertained. They want to, to walk out of the theater feeling a little different and a little better than they walked in. How do you keep a franchise going? I mean, this is going to go into the fifth thing. You know, what's your, you know, your uh, mantra in, in, in continuing it and making it, you know, making the audience want to come back and back and back, and each one is more successful than the other one? Well, it's always about keeping the talent together. That's what you try to do. And, and you know, three or four of the pirates were all written by Elliot and Rossio. So you keep trying to bring them back and, and create the, well, they created the characters, so they'll always create new characters in the, in the same vein. And then you try to keep the director in, involved. And we were fortunate enough to have Gore do three of them. And then Rob Marshall, who I thought is, is enormously talented. I've seen all his movies. He's unique. Uh, you know, he started as a choreographer and then a Broadway director and understands movement and action and drama, and he's got a strong visual sense. So I thought he could step in and, and give us a wonderful movie. And as it turned out, it topped a billion dollars for the fourth installment. So he did a, a phenomenal job. Is it difficult to convince Johnny to keep coming back to that role? I mean, I know you have a great relationship with him, but sometimes actors want to go on and... and well, Johnny loves the character, uh, you know, he loves, you know, what, I think one of the reasons that we got Johnny in, involved in it, he just had a daughter, and uh, he wanted to make something for his, for his, his child. Uh, you know, he'd done mostly art films and, and very interesting characters, uh, Edward Scissorhands and characters like that. So I think the fact that he wanted to be in a picture that would reach a little lower uh, as far as age, what kind of convinced him to do it. And he's he loves this character. I mean, let me tell you how much he loves it. He, he will carry a suitcase wherever he goes in the world of, of J Jack Sparrow's wardrobe. <laughs> and he will he will visit children's hospitals along the way and come into Jack Sparrow unannounced. Um, he He is just somebody who wants to give it back. And he you know, he's such a, it's a struggle when we're shooting in public places with Johnny because what will happen is if there's a queue line of people uh, wanting his autograph, he'll stop and sign every single autograph and come to the set an hour late because it takes that long for him to sign the autographs. When we were in Creed, Colorado on The Lone Ranger, he um, set up, when we were finished filming, he set up a, uh, like a little chair and a table outside City Hall and signed every single person's autograph in that little town. Uh, and this is after he'd been up at five in the morning, do the makeup, working all day in the hot sun, and then you know work till eight or nine o'clock at night just for his fans. So, you know, he f he knows he's blessed, and and he wants the people that support him and go pay money for his movies. He certainly wants to give them the time that he can afford to give them. You mentioned Lone Ranger. Now, that's the one. It's coming out on July 3rd, so it's just gearing up the uh, the big publicity campaign now. But it's another big, complex, very uh, difficult movie to pull off. As you mentioned, westerns are not exactly the obvious thing to do now. I mean, again, you're taking a risk. But um, every time you do a movie now, do you feel like you've got to reach a certain bar that you know people expect from Jerry Bruckheimer movies? Because you're a brand you know, in and of yourself. Well, I, I couldn't sleep at night if I did that. That would be really uh, <laughs> tough. Um, you know, you just try to make what you want to go see and populate it with very talented people, and you hope for the best. You don't, you don't know. You never know if a picture is going to be successful or not. I mean, you as an audience know much better more than I do if a picture is going to be successful. Uh, we make them and, and, you know, hope for the best and expect the worst, so you just don't know. Any producer or director who says they just made a huge hit movie is lying because he doesn't know. The only people that know is the collective audience. I think we might have the uh, trailer for the movie to show you guys. Do we? Yes. So if we do, let's take a look at it. That looks great. You know, I can't wait to see the movie. I saw extended uh, sequences of it at CinemaCon in Las Vegas in, in April. And the train sequence is extraordinary. It was another 
project with Disney that you had a hard time getting off the ground. You think, Jerry Bruckheimer, you can do whatever you want, and, and we saw the logo at the beginning, Disney, Jerry Bruckheimer Films, you share that. But this was famously, it was halted by the studio. It didn't look like it was going to get made because they didn't want to spend that much, as much money as you had budgeted. Can you tell us what happened there? I don't think I've made a big movie that wasn't canceled at one point or another. <laughs> so they all get canceled. Uh, it's, really? Yeah, they did, you know, Pirates was canceled a number of times. Uh, in fact, they actually liked the Rolling Ranger. They sent the crew home, and you had to kind of win it back. Uh, you know, that's part of the art of producing. The, part of the art of producing is trying to figure out how to get the budget to a number that they'll accept. And, you know, sometimes you have to go to your actors, and, and you have to give up money, and you have to figure out more creative ways to film things and, and make sacrifices, and the director has to give up sequences. and. But that's your job to convince them to do it without hurting the movie, uh, you know. And and Michael Bay, we, when we made uh, Pearl Harbor, uh, I think the budget was like twenty or thirty million dollars more than the studio wanted to spend, so we got canceled there too. Uh, but you know, we convinced Michael that there was a, a a way to make the picture that he could get everything he wanted uh, to make the film. And you know, I'll I'll tell you that when we cut the budget and. He did animatics of the, the Pearl Harbor attack. And if you look at the animatic that Michael did, which I'm sure is on the DVD, and you look at the sequence uh, that he filmed, it's almost identical. So by giving up the money, we figured out a way to make the picture more cost effective, yet giving Michael all the tools he needed to make the movie. And we did the same thing on Pirates and, and the same thing on The Lone Ranger. So there is a way to, to do things. You just have to be inventive and creative. and and your talent sometimes chips in to get the movie made because they believe in it. So you never say never, even with all that publicity that came out that said this movie's gone and it's not happening, you secretly were figuring out how it was going to happen. Yeah, that's what a producer does. You have to, you have to sit down with, uh, with the, the people who, who sharpen their pencils, the accountants, and you've got to look at every area in the movie and every you know, possible category and, and go to your... your you know, your designer, and what happens if we did made like in, in Lone Ranger? We we had one, we had we were going to build two towns. So what we did is we built one town and just changed the faces on it for the other town. So we saved an enormous amount of money. You go down, you go to every department, and you say, "How can you help me get this movie made?" Uh, and that's what they do. They you know they love the project. They wanted to see the movie to get, get getting made. So they chipped in and sharpened their pencils and got the budget down to something that, that Disney would accept. And like you have enormous cast of extras here, did you just like lay them off for certain scenes and um, save money that way? Or, you know, when you, when you do this kind of a thing, I think the budget was 260 million or something, and you wound up making it for? Over 200, I'll just say that. <laughs> okay, but you cut about 40 million out. You found ways to do it. Yeah, you know, you just, again, it's all about if you surround yourself with people who are enormously talented and don't have an ego about what they do, they will figure out ways to save you money and get the movie made because they want to work on the film. They get vested in, in the talent. They got vested in Johnny and Gore and our writers. and They didn't want to go home and work on another picture because they had prepped this movie. They were excited about this movie. They know what an enormously talented uh, director Gore is, and they want to be part of that party. And so they you know, chip in and figure out ways to get the picture made. And that's what they did, every one of them, including, you know, our writers would figure out ways to, to you know, shorten sequences or make sequences that were uh, less, uh, more cost effective, let's put it that way. And we got the movie made, and that's, that's all it that counts. You forget about everything else, you know, all that, the media that writes about all these pictures getting shut down or all movies getting shut down. When the picture comes out, it, that's all you care about. It's, it's you want to get your movies made, and you do what you have to do to get your movies made. I remember a, a little movie called Titanic that had that kind of press, you know, until it came out and became the big, biggest movie of all time when it came out. It's sort of what's on the screen. But here you didn't obviously didn't have to stint on the train sequences, and those aren't trains that existed, right? Those are trains you built here. <laughs> yeah, we built, uh, we built two trains, and we built five miles of track in, the, in New Mexico and in a loop, so we, that's another way to save money, because by doing it in a loop, we never had to s stop filming, so they could, you know, just keep going around in a circle and start filming. So that saved us time. Uh, that was, somebody figured that one out. <laughs> uh, you know, it just, you know, ingenuity, and there's so many talented people in Hollywood that will help you get these movies made.
And here you have, it's really a flip. I mean, they did do the Lone Ranger movie uh, in 1981 starring Clinton Spilsbury, which didn't exactly sell it. Um, you have Johnny Depp really as sort of the key figure here. You have the story being told, in other words, by the sidekick, by Tonto. How did that come about, or how did that idea come about to tell a, a new telling of The Lone Ranger? Well, that came from Gore and Justin Hayes, who, who came in and, and worked on it towards the end. Uh, Ellen Rosso first developed it. And uh, Gore said, why don't we have Tonto, you know, tell the story of, of The Lone Ranger as an old man in a, in a, in a sideshow at a, at, a, at a carnival. Uh, and that, that's where the idea kind of kind of started, uh, and then Justin started to write it. Yeah, and Johnny's look in this is extraordinary. I mean, with the with the bird and everything, that was was that Johnny bringing all that to that, or was that in the script? No, when we when I first pitched the idea of the Lone Ranger and Tonto to to Johnny, I think we were making one of the pirates, and then he went off and did um, Alice, and I get this photograph sent to me with this Indian with white uh, makeup on and black lines down his face and a crow on his head. Uh, I said, what is this? And it's, it's a note from Johnny. And I thought he put this makeup on one of the extras in Alice, but it was really him. And so he created it with his makeup artist. Uh, and, and that's how the character became. It was all, it was never in the script. Again, Johnny being inventive and creative. And that's why you want to work with an actor like that. He comes up with really interesting ideas always. You talked a little bit about creative collaboration being a key part of what you do as a producer. And you've obviously done it with Gore Verbinski. You have a kind of secondhand way of working with him now and, and giving him everything he needs as a director, but knowing what you have to deliver as a producer. Talk a little bit about working with Gore Verbinski all these years. And well, Gore is, is somebody who has a real vision. I mean, it's a unique vision. That's why we work with him. He, you know, he doesn't follow or copy, copy anybody. He has his own kind of engine. He's got like a 13-year-old trapped inside of him. So he's, uh, he, he really gets humor, knows how to set up a joke, knows how to pay it off. Uh, he understands drama. He's got a, a strong, strong visual sense, which we like all our directors to have, because it's not radio. It's actually something you look at, and you want it to look good or look interesting. And Gore does that. Uh, if you see the, his animatic of the train chases, they're identical to what you'll see on film, and hopefully they'll have it in the DVD package. So he knows what he wants, uh, and he's he's very driven to deliver it on screen. You know, can you imagine we're we're in the in the desert? There are 40 mile an hour winds. Uh, it, it's it's miserable most of the time. Every afternoon the wind kicks up. He's got these. He convinces these actors to get on top of this train, going very fast. Uh, and to get him to do what he wants him to do. You know, anybody else would do it with blue screen, but not Gore. He's got to do it the right way, and that's and it shows on, on, on camera. When an audience looks at it, they know that he actually was in these places that you see. We were in five different states. We were, in, you know, in Arizona and Colorado and New Mexico and California uh, and Utah, uh, where he filmed all these amazing action sequences. So what you see, when you see the train work, and they're on top of these trains, which you just saw, they're actually on top of the train. And it's going pretty fast. So it, it, he's, he's a good salesman, too. He can convince our actors to get up there. <laughs> Bill Fichter said it's the scariest thing he's ever done in his life, climbing on that train. So anyway, he's, he's, a, he's a four score. Speaking of that, you mentioned all those places that you had to take this production to. Is that a particular challenge for you as a producer to have to keep moving this massive, massive production uh, from uh, state to state? It is, and, and again, it comes down to people you, that you hire and you work with when you have really talented location people and line producers and production managers. They figure out how to get it done. Uh, they move this huge company. It's like, you know, it's like moving a division in the Army. Uh, to an, another location, you got to feed them, you got to house them, uh, you got to make sure they have transportation. So, I mean, Hollywood is filled with people who have been doing this for years and years, and we try to get the best at what they do to work on our movies, and they make it look effortless. How's Silver the horse? Is that one horse or several horses? Because that's my favorite character. I love Silver. We had <laughs> we had between four and six Silvers. Uh, the first two got fired. Uh, <laughs> they didn't they didn't work out, but. Uh, Every silver had, had its own expertise. We had the silver that he rode most of the time. We had the, one of the silvers that did uh, some of the gags. Each silver had a different gag to do. Uh, one of them drinks beer. Uh, 
So, I mean, you know, there, there, we had a lot of uh, uh, fantastic wranglers who, and horse trainers who worked with us to, to get our horses, and they picked the horses and, and uh, trained them. And you, you've always known for putting uh, new talent in and also putting well-known talent into different roles, like you turn Nicolas Cage into an action star, essentially, um, uh, uh, 17 years ago. But Army Hammer, how did that idea come about for him as the Lone Ranger? First of all, he towers above pretty much everybody. What is he, 6'6 six, six or something? He's 6'5", and you know, I saw him in, in Social Network, and I, I thought, wow, this is, not only is he handsome, uh, but he's a he's a very good actor, and we brought him in. Uh, Gore read him and said he's our guy. So Gore, you know, said that this this young man has a he's got a Jimmy Stewart kind of quality and a Gary Cooper kind of quality to him, and the character in the movie has got a little bit of Jack Lemmon, uh, the way they use humor in the picture. And Gore saw that in in Army and brought that out of him. Uh, and he's a very young actor. I think he just turned 25 uh, during the making of the movie. So uh, he's he's uh, he's going to be uh, around Hollywood for a long time. Yeah, and, you know, and now it's you're gearing it up. Of course, it's been a, it's it's a machine itself just to sell movies. I mean, the marketing of a movie al costs almost as much as the movie itself sometimes. Um, are you very closely involved as a producer in every aspect of how this movie is being sold and with the studio? Well, we're involved, but they do it. Uh, you know, Disney's got a, a phenomenal marketing distribution machine, and, and that's one of the reasons we're there, because they're so good at what they do. It's, it's really hard to make these movies and to get people to finance them, and when you make them and, and they don't know how to market them, you're really in trouble because the public doesn't know about your film, but Disney's very good at it. Uh, and so we work very closely with them, but they're the ones who execute it and do a phenomenal job of executing uh, the the I guess the message we want to give to the audience and you know we just started a picture in New York uh, called Beware of the Night uh, for Sony and Screen Gems and I flew back in today for this conference and then you know Monday we start I start with our Norwegian directors on getting ready to do Pirates and then at the end of the week we go to uh, New Mexico to Santa Fe to start a junket on the Lone Ranger and then we go to Moscow and after Moscow we come back here for about a week and then we go around the world promoting the Lone Ranger. So I'm involved in, in all of the promotion and advertising. Other people do it, uh, but we a actually have to travel with our talent ar you know, around the world and we're fortunate that Disney's going to spend the money to, uh, to do that for us and, and take us around the world and to promote a picture that we all love. Wow, that's a lot of traveling just to sell the movie, too. I mean, but that's necessary now, right? With all the competition, all these big movies, you've got a key date, 4th of July weekend, but um, so many big blockbusters all coming out at the same time. Do you think that's good for the industry to have it all sort of bunched in the summer or different, or different times of year? Or, or do you think it's a year-round business where you can open a film anytime? Well, I think they proved it, that it is a year-round business. You have pictures coming out in April and in March now that become big successes. Uh, you know, it all depends on, on the type of movie you have, but it, it's very hard this summer because there's so many big titles right on top of each other, and the way it works is you have to hold your seats. It's not as much about the number of theaters, but the number of seats that you get. So you have, you know, Superman opening, and then in its second weekend, I, you know, another picture will come in, and Superman, I mean, we moved into a smaller theater to make way for the next big blockbuster, if there is a blockbuster next to it. And if there isn't, so Superman will hold those seats. And the same thing with us. We'll have a picture, Pacific Rim, I think, comes out a week right after us, and they'll, they'll take some of our seats away. So that's why you see these drops in grosses right away, because, you know, when you go to these multiplexes, they'll have one or two big house, houses with, a, with 500 seats, and then you drop down to 250, and that's where your grosses go. They're, they're, they diminish quite quickly. But if you have a run where there's nobody behind you of note, then you can hold those theaters, and if the picture works, you're going to fill the seats up, and that's what you hope for. But this summer, everybody's cannibalizing each other. But the good news is if you make good movies that audiences want to go see, it, it increases their appetite to see more movies. So when Star Trek is a big hit and the next one that comes out is a big hit, then when they come down to us, hopefully they say, well, I had two or three really good experiences. We just saw Superman. We loved it. Let's go see The Lone Ranger. Uh, and that's what you want. You, I root for our competition to be really successful because it, it increases the appetite to see films. Uh, when, you, when there's a bunch of movies that audiences don't like, 
And they say, yeah, you know, I'll, I'll go to a Dodger game or I'll do something else. And because there's so many other activities that you can do between video games and television. There's so much good work on television now that people can just stay home. So you have to give them something special that drags them out of their house. Uh, hopefully, Lone Ranger is one of those films. And would this be a franchise, too, if this is as, as successful as you uh, hope and think it will be? It's always up to the audience. If the audience, you know, likes the movie and Disney will come to me and say we should make another one. Uh, if it doesn't do what they expect it to do, then it'll be a one-off. But, you know, s hopefully The Lone Ranger will continue and Johnny wants to play the character again and Army does too. So uh, that's that's what you hope for. You hope that, that the audience will be there and they'll fill those seats and, and then you can come back and give them another one. How is your relationship with Disney as a producer with the studio? You've obviously got a, a, a strong relationship, it seems. How long does it run for? Another couple of years or so? Yeah, we're there for a, a bit more, and, and so far it's been great. We've had enormous success together, and hopefully it continues. Um, you know, you never know, but um, I love working there. I love Bob Iger and, and his team. Uh, Alan Horn just came in, and Sean Bailey, and, and they're, they're, a, they're a wonderful group to work with, and... I've been fortunate enough because they're a big part of my success. You know, they give you notes. They're smart, and they give you ideas that help you. And you know, there's always this thing that the suits are always give you bad ideas. But you know, we'll take a good idea from anybody. It doesn't matter where it comes from. And the stronger the executive power you have of working with you, the better your movies are going to be. Uh, and when you have a weak team surrounding you, your your pictures won't benefit from people who are good at what they do and people outside outside of your little cadre of people making the movie, it's nice to have good ideas come your way. I have got to ask you because with all of the stuff you describe you do and everything with movies and things, you have this incredibly successful career in television too. I mean, it, that sort of started around 2000, I guess, with CSI and, and you really brought the whole idea of franchises to uh, CBS, which they're very grateful for obviously because CSI is still running. And the other two had long runs, uh, Miami and New York. And you have The Amazing Race, which you've won nine Emmys for, eight consecutively. You give no one else a chance to win for Best Reality Series. <laughs> <laughs> you have a new series starting on CBS this fall called Hostages. How do you have time to do it? And wh what's the attraction of television for you? Well, television is much different than movies. As I said, I don't know if I said it here, but we, it took us 14 years to get Beware of the Night made. And we, as I said, we started that Monday. So it's a long, you know, Lone Ranger was at least four years uh, from the time we bought the property to bring it to the screen, where television is so fast and so much fun to do because you start right around this time uh, developing ideas. And uh, before you know it, it's May, and you're either on the air or off the air. And in October, you find out if, if your show's a hit or not. So it goes so quickly, and, and the volume is enormous. So again, it, it, to me, it brings more talent that I can use for my movies, to use as talent it, as actors in our films, and vice versa. So we switch them back and forth. Uh, so it's a nice way to meet new talent, and it's something that's so immediate. If you like immediate gratification, get into television. <laughs> Hostages is based on an Israeli series, right? Yeah, yeah. and Dylan, is Dylan McDermott the star? Yeah, how did that come about? Um, uh, it's something that, that you know, we have Jonathan Lippman, Christiane Reed, and Mike Azzolino, who run our television department, and they brought the idea to me, and I think it was Mike and Christiane who found it, and, and we thought it was a great idea, and we Warner Brothers is where our television deal is, negotiated a deal to buy it, to buy the rights to it. And, you know, they developed it and got an excellent screenplay along with the help of CBS, who has uh, phenomenal management. Uh, Les Moonves is the one who really helped uh, make CSI the success that it, it became by, you know, guts and, and moving it to Thursday night when we were on a Friday and, you know, becoming one of the biggest shows on television. That's all his expertise and bringing us Billy Peterson. Uh, he, he'd always been a fan of Billy Peterson and wanted him to be in, in a series, and he was right. Uh, so, uh, again, it's, it's working with great executives, and, and Hostages is one of those shows that, that we developed. We, got, we were very fortunate. Tony Collette's also into it in, in the show, and it's a unique idea. It's, it's something that I don't think has been on television before, uh, and I think it's, it's, it's something that, that audiences will, will want to come back and see every week. Now, I've got some questions from the audience here, and she's going to bring them up to me. And as she does, I'm going to read something you once said that it just astounds me. I can't believe it's coming from Jerry Bruckheimer. But, you know, it just shows. Every time I make a movie, I think that it's going to be my last one. I think no one's going to show up. I always have the feeling that 
they're all going to fail. I'm scared to death. Is that true? I feel the same way. July 3rd, I'm going to be scared to death. <laughs> so it's, it, it never ends. We have this fear of failure, and that's what drives us to, to try to make them as good as we can make them. Does that really help you, though, in making good movies, is to have that sense of, of th that you might fail, so you're going to do you know, even more? I don't think anybody gets out of bed and says, hey, I'm going to fail today. You know, today's a good day to fail. <laughs> I think we just we want to succeed, and, and you work so hard to, to try to succeed. And if, if you ever forget that you could fail, you're going to fail because you, you, any time you go to bat, you, know, you could strike out, and you have to have that focus to, to keep your eye on the ball, and, and uh, you can never let it waver. And what hang, hangs in the back of your mind is, oh, my God, nobody's going to show up. So that's what pushes you to, to work even harder. And one more quote, and I, I promise I'm getting to these, but um, being a critic, I was interested in this. You said, if I made films for critics or for someone else, I'd probably be living in some small Hollywood apartment. Do you yeah, care well, what critics say? Yeah, you always care. Nobody wants to get bad reviews or, you know, I think you, 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 know, you like to have people praise your work. But, you know, unfortunately, some of the critics don't appreciate what we do. Uh, we make movies for big audiences. My wife always said it should be like music, where uh, somebody who reviews classical mu music isn't going to review 50 cents or give you uh, the kind of review that, that he would like. Uh, and you have critics out there who love My Dinner with Andre is not going to love The Lone Ranger. So, you know, it's a, it's a, and we have to deal with that. Uh, but, you know, hopefully there's enough critics who like popular culture and and we'll hopefully like our films. And maybe you could do my dinner with the Lone Ranger for the next one. And you never please know. everybody. Yeah. Um, here's a question from the audience. We have several here, actually. Of all your projects, which is your most memorable for you and why? I, I think they all are. I mean, every time you, you step on a movie set, it's a new experience. I don't know if you've, any of you have gone to summer camp uh, where you have this intense relationship with the people you're, you're with for that those four weeks or eight weeks during the summer, and then you go off to your own lives. And that's exactly what happens in making movies. You have this real intense relationship for 10 or 20 weeks, however long it takes to make the movie, and then we all go off and disappear. So they're all a big part of your life and, and things that you remember and cherish, whether they're good experiences or bad experiences, you learn from them. Now, how do you know when a script is ready to uh, show to talent and studios? When do you know it's time to stop tinkering? Do you hold them back before you're absolutely certain? What do you do? No, I think you, you work them till you feel that you have something that, that's kind of special. You never quite stop tinkering with them. At least we don't. We tinker with them until they pull them away from us and in, in, in we have to put them in the theaters. I mean, we were tinkering with the Lone Ranger until they dragged it away from us a week ago. So. Uh, you always tinker with it. Can you, you always feel you can make it a little better, and that's what we do. Now, this is saying, what were some of the more defining moments of your career? I think we've heard a, a lot about that, but was there one defining moment um, in your career that really was a turning point? I think there are a number of them. The, the fact that I was t brought to Hollywood uh, you know, back in the 70s by Dick Richards was a defining moment. Uh, uh, partnering with Don Simpson, you know, and having that great partnership for, for a number of years. And then, you know, being in Disney for all these years. So, uh, you know, these partnerships have, have really worked out well, and I learned a lot through them. Beth has a question that actually I was going to ask. I'm glad you asked it, Beth, uh, wherever you are in, out there. Hope you ever learned any less. Have you ever learned any lessons from a failure that you can share here? I don't know if I could share them, but I, I, learn, <laughs> I learn lessons every day from failures. Uh, that's what, uh, what makes us better filmmakers is when you, when you make a mistake and, and you say, well, this, this mistake I made, I'm not going to make this one again. And, you know, every time you come up to bat, you're going to make a mistake. And, and you, then you've you got to go ahead and, and try to rectify that mistake the next time you, 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 you get up to make a film. Is there some, some project, something you just wanted to make that you haven't been able to make, that you really just have, I, I'm going to do this someday, or, or, or it, it just never worked? Uh, you know, we develop 40 projects, and, and every one of them we want to bring to the screen. Some of them become dated because other people will jump on the idea and, and make it before we, we do, so we lose those. Uh, but, you know, 14 years working on, on uh, Beware of the Night, that just shows you uh, how difficult it is to get movies made and how we stick with them. So there's a ton of our projects that we still want to get made and are still working on all the time. Um, this guy wants to know, are you using the William Tell Overture for The Lone Ranger? <laughs> You'll have to see the movie, but uh, <laughs> it might be in there.
spoken like a true producer. Um, how do you balance the audience's desire to emotionally connect with a character versus their desire for spectacle and visual effects? So that's, that's something you touched on, bringing emotion and, and, and the human element to these bigger projects. Uh, that, that's the most important thing. I mean, you have to connect the character with the audience. Uh, if you have spectacular visual effects and fantastic action, but you're not vested in the character, um, you're not going to hold the interest of, a, of an audience. You've got to be vested in your characters. That's the most important thing you can do as a producer to force your writers, good writers know that, uh, that you have to have these characters uh, to be something that an audience either wants to be or want to be like or actually sometimes hate. So that's so important. What is your greatest strength as a producer? You know, I think, you know, with self-evaluation, uh, I think that uh, just knowing talent, I mean, recognizing talent, knowing, you know, who's, who's really got a gift and who doesn't. Uh, so I think that's something you develop through the years, and I've been doing it for, I guess, over 40 years now, so I've figured out some of it, not all of it, and I'm, I'm still learning every day. I'm just wondering, too, I mean, do you think that the art of producing, I mean, you know, you're a throwback to the great uh, tradition of Hollywood of one producer, you know, and one producer. I remember another famous Jerry, Jerry Wald, who worked a lot at this studio, and, and those great producers. Now it's like some movies you see 20 producing credits, which this guild has really tried to uh, stop and control and really see the work of a producer come out. Um, what do you think, do you think that we've sort of lost what a real producer is. Well, I think there's a lot of real producers in Hollywood. Uh, you know, a lot of pictures have difficulty getting financing, and a lot of people say, well, you give me a credit and I'll give you money. Uh, and as a filmmaker, you, you want to get your movie made, so you give up credits pretty easily. Uh, and that's what happens to a lot of movies, so that's why you see all these credits, and not that they don't deserve them, because, you know, you write a check, it's a difficult thing to do. Uh, and it to, you know, gamble your money, because it is a gambling business. You never know what's going to succeed. There's no sure things. Uh, so I think that's that's part of what our business is. You have to accept some of these credits because otherwise you don't get your movie made. Doesn't mean they did anything more than write a check, but that's you know, if you don't have the money, there's nothing on the screen. What do you think of the uh, PGA mark, which seems to be gaining uh, a growing acceptance among studios now, and and you know a sign that this was really was a producer's movie. I think that's a wonderful thing for for an audience to see that, that people actually worked on the movie and developed it and and, you know, hired the people and, and saw the project through from the beginning to end. So it, it's, a st it's a seal of, of acceptance by the industry and the producers that you actually worked very hard on it. All right, back to the audience questions. I love the look of the film and feel it's worth uh, continuing to shoot on film. I love the look of film and feel it's worth continuing to shoot on film. What are your thoughts about film? Obviously, film has become like a, a dinosaur almost in this business. It's all digital now. Yeah, it's unfortunate, but that's where it's going, and digital now is, is, if it's not there yet, will be as good as film, if not better. In fact, some of the images are so sharp that we have to detune it um, because it looks like videotape. It's so, it's so vivid. Uh, so on this movie, we shot film for the exteriors and did, did uh, digital for the interiors because your, your ISO or your ASA is so much, so much better on digital than it is on film. Uh, but there's nothing like film, and unfortunately, we're losing film. Uh, you look at the cameras you carry around with you, and you, some of the people in the audience, they're all digital now, and that's what's happening with theaters. They're becoming all digital. I think in the next four or five years, or even sooner, there won't be any more film in, in theaters. I saw a critic screening of Superman movie uh, Thursday at Warner Brothers, and it, after the first hour, it went down, and we waited an hour for it to come back. I kept thinking, if this was film, all they would have had to do was splice it, but it was a computer breakdown, so... The movie was three and a half hours instead of two and a half hours. <laughs> but that's the, that's the downside of, of digital. I've, I've been in many screenings like that. But anyway. Well, the same thing happens with film. I've been in some of our movies where the film breaks or the projector breaks or the sound goes down. So that's the risk of any time you show a, a film to a big audience. Uh, stuff happens, unfortunately. Does that freak you out as a producer? It scares you to death. You know, when, you're, when your picture goes down and you're, you're showing it to an audience for the first time and then you have critics in the audience and... That's very painful. Uh, this says, how involved are you in the casting for your projects? How much personal control do you actually exercise, or do you leave it to uh, the, whoever the director is? No, we're involved in, in every decision, uh, not as much in television, but certainly on all the leads on our TV shows. But in movies, we're, you know, we work with our directors and our casting uh, people to, to uh, you know, 
get the best cast together. So we're, we're very involved in every aspect of filmmaking. And part two of this person's question is a plea to you. Please consider producing The Dark Tower. I'm sure somebody else has the rights, but uh, <laughs> good luck to them anyway. It's, it's something that hopefully will get to the screen. Okay, this one, I don't, the Anthony um, Zucker and William Peterson met resistance when we scouted with them in Vegas for CSI, but the city uh, filled all over, fell all over when it hit. How much resistance have you had to overcome with projects that eventually prevailed? I'll, I'll say that at first, CSI met all this resistance, but all of a sudden, Vegas really got on board, I guess. So. I think anything new that you do re uh, gets resistance, uh, it, no matter what it is, because it's fresh. If you walk in and you, you want to make another Pirates, you know, they open the red carpet for you. But before, they don't know what it is, and they're afraid of it, and they give you a hard time. So that's just, just human nature. All right, now, uh, Melanie uh, has that, that great chestnut, that classic question. If you could give just one piece of advice to us as fellow producers, what would it be? Yeah, I think you gotta stick with it. I think that's, the, you know, tenacity is what got me here. And, and you know, understanding what a good idea is, what a good story is, uh, that's the key. And you gotta stick with it and, and keep pushing it. And sometimes you're pushing the wrong idea, but you know you'll find that out soon enough. <laughs> but uh, we keep we keep if we believe in something, we keep we keep at it. In line with that, uh, how many projects do you manage at any one time? I think you s actually said 40. But how do you balance them? How do you? Well, they're always in various phases of development. You know, something is some we're looking for writers, uh, some that we're we're working with a current writer, some need rewrites. So they're in various phases of development. Uh, and sometimes you have a great plot and your characters are weak, so you're looking for a character writer to punch it up. You know, it's rare in Hollywood that you find writers that can deliver something uh, from beginning to end because the ones that can, you can't get them. They're so difficult. They're booked, um, you know, years in advance. So it's, it's hard. You have to f convince writers that are th at the top of their game to take on your project, and sometimes you have to wait a year. So there's another reason that a project will sit there to get the right writer. Colleen, uh, hi Jerry, what's one thing you know now that you wish you knew when you started? One thing you know now. I think how difficult it is, you know, you don't m realize that w it looks so easy. You know, you look at the Lone Ranger and say, God, that looks interesting and looks very simple to do, but to get this done, <laughs> my God, it's like pulling a train across country. It's, you know, it's really <laughs> tough. How did your image of what a producer did when you were starting out match up with the reality of the reality of it? So the glamour, the, the way we see movie producers as an image versus the reality. Well, I think the ones that prevail are the ones that work really hard. Uh, and you know, you don't see me sitting with a martini and a cigar in, in a bar. Uh, that's not what producers do. They, you're, you're working at it all the time. You're trying to, to, again, make whatever you're working on better, and that takes an enormous amount of work and effort. You talked a little bit about television and, and doing CSI, but what convinced you specifically to do it, just to jump into that uh, world? Uh, again, it's, you know, I saw some of the work that was being done by, by some of the great television producers, and I said, you know, why don't we bring what we've learned in making movies and some of the talent that we've discovered and bring them to the small screen. I mean, I think CSI visually was a breakthrough from what we did and, and what, what Anthony created about, you know, getting inside and, you know, showing the microcosm of, of what these CSIs do. Uh, you know, he brought something really special to, to television. And then we were fortunate enough to convince Danny Cannon, who was a feature director, to come in there and, and develop the project and, and direct it for us. And he brought something special to it. And, you know, Zyker was the one who came up with the idea, and uh, Carol Mendelson and Ann Donahue, who were veterans of television, and, and Anthony hadn't done television. So that team, they kind of learned from, from the ideas that Anthony came up with, and, and Carol and Ann kind of put it in television language and knew how to create the characters that would last uh, for a long time, working with Anthony and then getting a talent visualist like Danny Cannon to actually execute it. Uh, was a big get for us. Um, and, and what new methods of producing, uh, how do you compare your job as a producer to the jobs of independent low-budget producers, or is there a difference? 
There's no, there's no difference except the independent producers have a much harder job because we go to one source for financing usually, and that's for me it's Disney or Warner Brothers and television, where an independent producer has to run around and get people who either want credit or want something for the money that they put into a movie. So it's a much more difficult thing to do. Uh, and, you know, and my hat goes off to anybody who, who, who does that. It's very, very hard. Um, I'm going to just ask a couple because our time is just about out. But, um, you know, you've won every award possible. You've been honored by this guild several times. You've, you've been named the top producer of the decade, of the year, of, of everything. Does, do, do you still get a thrill when your name is called? I mean, I watch you at the Emmys every year, and you always seem so happy when you win. Uh, um, <laughs> you know. Yeah, and, you know, it's nice to get awards. You know, we love it. Uh, it's nice to be honored for the work because you work so hard at doing it. And it's nice when people recognize it. You know, I'm sure everyone here would love to be up there getting an Emmy, and, and that's a real thrill, let me tell you. What do you do with all of them? Uh, they're up in the office. They're all well, these wonderful line of, of statues that are up there that show the excellence of the people who worked on that show. And, and Amazing Race is different because it's a reality show, and there's so many producers involved, and they rotate, and we get new people in all the time. So, you know, even though we've won nine, some of them have never, the ones working on it right now, have never won any. Uh, so it's great to, to keep giving these, these producers who work so hard on this series, and it's such a hard series to, to make. I mean, they travel all over the world. They, they find filmmakers in, in, in somewhere in Mongolia to work with them, and, and guides, and Bertrand Van Munster, uh, who travels around the world with his tiny little suitcase and carry-on, and, and just can get these things done uh, wherever, and he's you know, carrying the troop of people around the world in a very short period of time. So it's a very, very hard show to produce. And I think, I think that that's what the Academy understands, how hard and difficult it is to drop people into these countries, especially the way the world is today and the frightening things that happen, not only things with weather, but other things. So in a lot of countries, we can't even go into because they're too dangerous. And reality television is certainly a big, big thing now. You know, people love that. Uh, finally, uh, do you sometimes fantasize about doing something entirely different, such as a Broadway play or a small indie or a, a book about photography? Were you very much in photography? Even write an autobiography someday? Um, you know, I love what I do, and, and even I think we have a book coming out in, in October on some of the stuff that I've done and some of my my work, uh, or a lot of my work as a producer. So that's that's going to be fun to do to uh, promote that. Uh, but you know, I, I, my day is, is really full with what we're producing, and that's what my focus is. Uh, and once you lose that focus and you start moving into other areas, uh, I think then the work is going to suffer. You got a a big birthday coming up in September. Any thoughts of ever giving this up, giving this business that you love up? Uh, you know. At one point, it's going to give me up, you know, because I'll lose, <laughs> I'll lose the connection that I have to the audience and won't be able to do it anymore. There's a lot of people in this audience who will be doing it much better than, than I have done it. Uh, and, you know, I, I hope you do. So I wish you all the best. And, you know, that just happens. We, it goes past us. That train keeps going, and, you know, we're left behind sometimes. But uh, fortunately, I can knock on wood that uh, it's, it's been really good to me so far. And if you keep that train on a loop, you never have to give it up. I have to do that, I guess. <laughs> Jerry Bruckheimer. Thanks so much.